Hi friends, Tris here. I have something to share with you that I'm very proud of. This is the pilot episode of my latest podcast, The Phosphine Catalogue, written and produced by me. I will be publishing season one every two weeks from January to March 2024. I'll cross-post the first three episodes right here in the No Boilerplate feed. But if you like what you hear, please go to phosphinecatalogue.com and subscribe now on Spotify, iTunes, or via RSS on your favourite podcatcher. Links in the show notes. The show is presented as a series of cassette tapes discovered in a cardboard box, untouched in an attic for decades. I loved writing it, and I hope you love it too. Thanks, my winner. Here's the introduction to the next issue. Welcome to the Phosphine Catalogue, number 15001. We see a light where others see only darkness. We're grateful to readers for their patience with the missing issue last week, the first one in the history of this publication due to the disappearance of the previous curator. My name is Jude Francis Sharp and I've stepped in to continue to provide your illustrious service. The reader, I hope, will forgive me a small introduction. I studied fine art in Paris and maintain my own modest studio and gallery here in London. I've been a customer of the catalogue for many years, as are many of my colleagues and friends. I live with several other artists, and we regularly delight in reading the descriptions of the wondrous items in the catalogue to each other. All quite out of our price range, of course. I'm thrilled to now to be on the other side of the page, so to speak. We all wish curator Edith McKinley a swift and safe return. Lot number 7112. Cunning Woman. Unknown artist, circa 1800s. Small statue in granite and tin. This piece is an effigy of glittering stone with shining metal highlights that wonderfully catch any glimmer falling into it and reflect brilliant starlight. Our client had attempted to put this statue up for auction at Sotheby's, but had been given a most pessimistic estimate by London's foremost auction house. I could understand why that might have been. The piece is modest, only 14 inches high on a plinth of what looks to be wood torn from a tea box or similar contemporary packing crate. Underneath there is a small brand burnt into the thin wood of a ship with black sails. No words or identifiable company name are to be found. A shame, as this would have made dating this piece easier. No doubt this is why Sotheby's could not give the value, only offering to sell it as a nice-looking thing of unknown provenance. Luckily for you, dear reader, they see darkness but we see light. Cunning Woman is roughly cut from Cornish granite. Of that, we can be certain. We have a friend at King's College who was able to chemically prove this at their laboratory, out of hours. Most interestingly for our organisation, and likely for our clients, is the glittering of crushed phoenix feathers visible best by moonlight in the tin detailing, a quintessentially Cornish technique dating back to pre-Roman times. The squat figure of the woman is presented nearly in abstract. The unknown sculptor has taken a simple block of granite seemingly straight from the quarry and made the absolute minimum number of chisel strokes to reveal the woman inside the speckled rock. While the stone is simple, though striking in design, the tin detailing around the woman's hands, eyes and particularly her open mouth with tiny teeth visible is astonishing. The tin, gleaming brighter than silver under the unforgiving strip lights of our warehouse, seems almost fused with the rock. There is no raised edge of the finely detailed tin inlay, nor has it been poured into a channel cut into the granite, or otherwise. Running my thumb carefully over the tin reveals no imperfections whatsoever. The artist, whoever that may be, and we have tried unsuccessfully to hunt them down, has somehow painted the stone with tin and is soaked into the very rock. This lost technique is only extant in a few statues, due to most examples being destroyed in the Reformation during the dissolution of the monasteries. I would advise interested buyers to contact their banking agent and provide a letter of credit so that the transfer arrangements may be made in short order after the closing of bidding. As usual in these high-value items, we make our in-house master jeweller available to those clients wishing to pay in gold. Cunning Woman was easy for me to find in our warehouse, despite the catalogue's underground warren of tunnels and interconnected cellars. The moment the heavy vault door closed behind me, I did not need the inscrutable leather map nor the lot number. Despite my current inexperience in navigating the Cyclopean labyrinths, I simply needed to follow my ears. I first took the sound to be London street traffic, 
just a few feet above the ceiling. Or perhaps one of the interconnected waterways that cause such problems with humidity. Fear not, reader, we have taken every precaution against natural and unnatural disaster. As I walked closer to the thick metal barred section that was my goal, I could make out words, but not in a language I could speak. Perhaps in a language few people speak anymore. Heavy metal key in hand and rounding a moss-covered foundation corner, I saw her. Tin features gleaming in the white neon light, and discovered the source of the ethereal sound. Reader, she sings. Lot number 3988. Forest Spirit. Lisanne van Velde, 1930. Oil on canvas. Frame missing. The painting unrolls to a four foot square and I believe would benefit from hanging in a room with high ceilings panelled in dark wood. Looking at the scene itself is a lush green forest clearing, framed left and right by a deeply detailed canopy with glimpses of woodland creatures starting in the undergrowth. Delicate insects hang gently in the air, suggesting to me a comforting humidity and stillness that only the deep forest can provide. When you view this marvellous example of Dutch realism, please lean close to the canvas and examine the artist's technique for yourself. Through a gap in the tree line, an almost horizontal slash of light floods the scene. Van Velde has captured the honey-coloured warming light of a late spring morning sunrise with almost photorealistic talent. Indeed, the light itself is the subject of this painting. Not the clearing, or the stone altar in the centre, nor the empty eye sockets of the skull in the bottom right. This is not a cheap memento mori, reminding the viewer that all one day will perish. It tells us that when we do, the forest will not care. I find myself staring into that light. It draws the eye from all parts of the scene. As a moth to flame, as a parched horse to water, as a wolf to the hunt. It pours out of the fabric of the canvas, spilling onto the floor, sending shafts of gold up to the ceiling. So hot it nearly burns my hands when holding it, despite my pristine cotton gloves. There's something written in pencil on the reverse of the canvas. Just above the bottom edge, in block capitals. Misspelled, uneven. The pressure of the letters almost breaking the brittle varnish on the face. It reads, To hear the music in the trees, you must be silent. This is not forest spirit. I've seen the original hanging in the south wing of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. This isn't even a copy. It's mistitled. The documentation the Phosphine catalogue received with this painting suggests that the work would have been framed in dark mahogany, but the frame is now entirely missing. The edges of the canvas show the telltale marks of it having been inexpertly cut from the frame. It is not the nature of this establishment to pry into the affairs of its clients, nor do we take responsibility for the veracity of their claims. Those are for our buyer to decide upon, by prior appointment at our showroom in Whitechapel. My role as both curator and compiler is to describe the items as I see them here in our warehouse. The catalogue specialises in those items that cannot be sold at other auction houses. Paintings of lost origin, statues that are too grotesque for public display, and books better left unread. Given the age, lack of history and nature of this canvas, I believe it was part of the Netherwood Hoard looted last year in November of 1975. Moella, do we know who the client was for number 3988? Uh, no, of course we don't. Well, I better not put most of this in the catalogue when I write it all up. Now, what's next? 
You just heard the pilot episode of the Phosphine Catalogue, a Namtau production. The voice of Jude Francis Sharp is Wolfie Thorns. The show is written and produced by me, Tris Oten, and all the music can be found at my website, namtau.com. For our merch store, Mastodon account, and Patreon, check out the podcast's website, phosphinecatalogue.com. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.